Hello, everyone. We're just letting people get um, into the webinar and we'll start in a moment. <clears throat> Glad to see you all here tonight. We'll be starting in one moment. We still have more people joining. Just give them another minute. Let a few more people in and then we'll start. Okay, well, good evening. We're so glad that you joined us tonight. Gallatin Valley Earth Day is thrilled to present Local Recycling, Where Does My Plastic Go? Uh, my name is Ann Reddy, and I'm the chair of the Gallatin Valley Earth Day Committee. I'm looking forward to learning about local recycling in just a few minutes. But first, before we hear from Alexis Alloway, I wanted to let you know about an upbeat film that Gallatin Valley Earth Day and the Valley of the Flowers Project is presenting in April called 2040. 2040 imagines a future we could create if we embrace the best climate solutions available today so that our children will have a better world by 2040. In this charming film, the filmmaker Damon Gamo, concerned about his young daughter's future, travels the world in search of new approaches and solutions to climate change. He meets with innovators and change makers in many fields to draw on their expertise. Come away inspired by watching 2040 anytime you like online starting Sunday, April 11th. Get the link on our website at www.gallatinvalleyearthday.org. Details are also provided in the handout that you can download. Uh, the handouts are located on the right side of your screen. Um, if you look on the little bar at the right, um, there are uh, Oh, a little more than halfway down. There are little red squares and there are five handouts listed there. And uh, you can click on them and download them if you like. Uh, the film 2040 is available to watch thanks to the generous support from Hope Lutheran's Creation Care Team, Happy Trash Can, Bozeman Farmers Market, Treeline Coffee, Heaps Grocery, and Lot G Cafe. While you're on the Gallatin Valley Earth Day website, check out our calendar of events, which lists numerous additional Earth Day events in April, including our next virtual talk, which is on Tuesday, April 13th at noon, and it's called Wind Energy Basics. It's with Rob Larson, a Montana State Professor of Engineering, who will talk about the potentials for wind energy in Montana, and we have a special guest, Terry Wycombe. He's the mayor of Rawlings, Wyoming, and he will share his town's experience with bringing in a large wind farm and tell how it boosted their local economy. You can find out how to register for this event by downloading the handout. And we also provide information in a follow-up email. Lastly, I wanted to give a big thanks to our major sponsors, who are supporting at least 30 free events, both virtual and in-person this year. Our sponsors include Oboe Footwear, Wrestler Motors, Greater Gallatin United Way, and Sacagawea Audubon Society. A special thanks goes out to Sacagawea Audubon Society for providing our webinar platform for this evening and providing our tech support. Now, before I introduce Alexis, I just wanted to point out a few features of our webinar platform. Uh, at the end of Alexis's talk, you may submit questions and uh, using the question button on the panel on the right side of your screen. So if you look to the right side of your screen, you'll see that um, there is in gray a little question, um, a 
question box. You click on the arrow and it'll open up and you can type in your question. There's also another way to get our attention if you want to ask a question um, in person. Um, if you go up and find your name on the attendee list, there's a little hand at the top. And if you click on that column, um, you can raise your hand and um, we will um, have you unmute yourself and you can ask your question. So anyway, now I think we are finally ready to introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, Alexis Alloway is the Municipal Contract Administrator for Republic Services in Bozeman, uh, where she heads up recycling education and general public outreach. Prior to coming to Republic of Services, uh, Alexis worked in environmental consulting, specializing in conservation education related to waste reduction, recycling, climate change, energy conservation, and water conservation. Alexis believes that small changes with our everyday consumption and waste habits can lead to big environmental benefits and she looks for every opportunity to educate the community about the benefits of waste prevention. So uh, Alexis, take it away. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you so much for everyone who's joining in tonight. It is absolutely fantastic to see such great turnout. So tonight's presentation is Local Recycling, Where Does My Plastic Go? I am Alexis Alloway from Republic Services here in Bozeman. And I just want to get my screen correct here. Um, basically, a little bit of background information about us, Republic Services. So we provide garbage and recycling services throughout all of Gallatin County. So we serve Bozeman, Belgrade, out to Three Forks, and then all the way down south through Gallatin Gateway to Big Sky and West Yellowstone. At Republic Services, we provide reliable and responsible waste solutions for any of your waste needs. So whether you're a resident who's looking for a curbside pickup at home, if you're a business owner who needs to get dumpsters for your business, or let's say you're working on a construction project or a home renovation, we can help you out. Here in Bozeman, um, our hauling operation is based right on Huffine Lane, and we have over 40 employees who serve a variety of roles to help keep our community clean and safe. So we employ a whole bunch of drivers, we have some mechanics, we have welders, we have operations managers, a dispatcher, um, sales associates, customer service reps. Uh, we have a great team that work really, really hard to keep our operations running smoothly and serve the community. In addition to providing excellent service, I have the most fun job at Republic Services. I do get to do community outreach and recycling education. So one of our core values as a company is being good neighbors and giving back in the communities that we serve. So this looks like everything from providing free recycling education and outreach at farmers markets or schools or youth groups to sponsoring litter cleanup days to helping support our local nonprofits through a community grants program that we have. Last year in 2020, we donated money or free service to over 50 nonprofit organizations. So we're really proud to help the community in any ways that we can. Um, and the other thing I'll say about myself is I have worked in the industry more in a communications and education role. So I am by no means a chemist or a plastic expert, but I do have a pretty good understanding of how things work. And I like to share that with the public um, because a lot of us throw garbage away and never think or know what kind of happens to materials after they are picked up from us. So I'm super excited to give this talk tonight on behalf of Republic Services because sustainability is actually one of our company's top priorities. In 2019, Republic Services developed long-term sustainability goals that we call our Boo Planet 2030 because that's the year we want to achieve the goals by. And basically we recognize that sustainability helps save resources, it helps invest in people and communities, and ultimately it does help our businesses bottom line when we can use resources efficiently. 
So our sustainability actions are mostly focused around reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And that's everything from looking at the efficiency of our driving routes to decrease fuel consumption, um, switching over to cleaner fueled vehicles. So looking at electric vehicles, clean natural gas, um, and also looking at emissions that come from the landfills that we own and operate and really looking at um, ways to harness landfill gas and use it to provide electricity. Um, we are doing a little research looking at plastic waste. Um, we do own and operate numerous recycling facilities around the country. Currently, plastics make up about 9% of the recyclables that we collect, and our company is My goals for the talk this evening are, I first wanna start by helping you all understand some of the big picture issues surrounding plastics. I wanna help you all see behind the scenes what happens to your plastic waste in Gallatin County. So we're actually gonna take a look at our garbage systems as well as recycling. And then finally, I wanna help every one of you identify something that you can do to shrink your own plastic footprint. Uh, I think plastics is a really big topic. It can feel overwhelming, but there are lots and lots of choices that we can make in our everyday lives from a personal to community level. So I do hope that tonight I can give you some ideas uh, and that you'll actually practice one of those ideas in real life. So starting out with that big picture overview of plastics, so let's think about what plastic is. Plastic is a synthetic material that is traditionally made from fossil fuels. So either natural gas or crude oil. There are some bioplastics out there nowadays that are made from plant-based materials like corn or sugar cane, but most plastics that we use are traditional plastics coming from fossil fuels. So the picture I'm showing you right now shows you the seven major different types of plastics that we have. So we can categorize plastics based on their chemical composition or basically the ingredients that compose them. Um, the plastics identification codes, we actually use numbers to code them. So there's numbers one through seven, and it's worth noting that uh, plastic number seven is a catch-all term used to identify a bunch of different materials that are plastics, but that are not specifically PVC or P. We have lots of different types of plastics and they have taken over our lives. Uh, you probably could count a billion different uses for plastics if you tried. Um, we do use them for everything. I'm guessing every one of you is sitting somewhere right now where you could probably reach your arm out and touch something plastic. Uh, I'm wearing some plastic, I'm sitting in a plastic chair, my computer, I'm wearing plastic, uh, sitting in a plastic chair, my computer has plastic parts to it. So plastic really has become ubiquitous in our society. And the reason why is that plastic does have a whole bunch of great things about it. Um, it's lightweight, which is awesome for shipping and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It can be flexible. It's usually pretty strong. It can be waterproof or impermeable. It's super durable. It's designed to last a really long time. And it also can be a good insulator if you're interested in thermal properties. Um, best of all, and maybe one of the biggest reasons why plastic has become so popular is that it is pretty cheap to manufacture. So manufacture plastics is exactly what we have done. Um, this graph is showing you global plastic waste 
from 1950 to 2015. So obviously it's also a direct <laughs> result of global plastic production. And you can see from the graph that essentially our production of plastics is a fairly recent phenomena. It wasn't really until after World War II that plastics became mainstream, um, but their use has exploded and it continues to grow year after year. It is worth noting on that graph too that plastic packaging, those disposable plastics that we use one time and throw away, do make up a pretty significant portion of our global plastic waste. So unfortunately, while plastic does have all these benefits, there are also a lot of drawbacks to plastic as a material. Um, if anyone watched the story of plastic, they did a really great job of pointing out just how complicated it is to manufacture plastics and how much pollution is involved in that process, as well as getting us to think about some of the environmental justice issues surrounding the production of plastics and environmental impact. It's probably safe to say, and I don't really have to explain, that none of us want to live next door to an oil refinery or a plastics factory, and none of us probably want to have a crude oil pipeline running through our backyard. Um, so it kind of goes without saying that we know there are definitely health and environmental impacts. The environmental impacts have been getting more and more attention, and there are a lot of environmental impacts that come with managing plastic waste. So the very durability that we desire, the, one of the main reasons we love plastics, they're durable, it becomes a liability when it comes to disposal, because basically plastics don't go away. Nature's way of dealing with waste, what nature has done for billions of years, is basically using the process of decomposition to recycle materials through our ecosystems. So when it comes to traditional petroleum-based plastics, decomposing organisms like worms and bugs and bacteria, they are not able to digest and break down plastics. So plastics don't biodegrade, which means if they do get into the ecosystem, that they stay there. Um, so this can lead to problems with the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and other garbage patches in the ocean. I'm sure everyone's heard of that before. Uh, we can get bioaccumulation where basically due to the physical properties of plastics it can accumulate harmful bacteria and pathogens we all have seen really sad images and heard stories of animals ingesting plastics or getting entangled them and dying um, the, the list of issues with plastics just kind of goes on and on and something i want to point out is a lot of times the focus is around oceans and ocean pollution of plastic but we are not immune from plastic pollution here in the gallatin valley uh, the image i'm showing you right now i snapped this photo on my afternoon run in south bozeman today and i could have taken this photo anywhere along <laughs> um, the roads in our community go outside and walk a block away from your home and count the plastic trash items that you see and you will see that wow Wow, we have a lot of plastic in our ecosystem, which means that these plastics are going to end up in our waterways and they're going to be transported far away, potentially even to the ocean eventually. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a study done by Environment Montana where they looked at over 50 different fishing sites in Montana. And their study revealed that there was plastic pollution in over 70% of the fishing sites that they surveyed. So we are seeing plastics both in our land based ecosystem and our water based ecosystems, even in some of the most remote and pristine feeling places in Montana. So when we look at the bigger picture of plastic waste and how much we generate in the US, um, plastics actually make up just 12% of our municipal waste stream at about 46 million tons per year. Um, you'll notice that organics in general, like food and yard trimmings, actually make up the biggest portion of our waste. Um, so the claims that like plastics are filling up our landfills is not exactly true when we look at the data, but still, obviously, it's not desirable to be filling our landfills with anything that maybe shouldn't be there. Uh, so what's happening to all this plastic waste? Well, nationally, if we look at EPA data um, for 2018, the last year they had data available, 
in the US, less than 9% of our plastic waste was recycled. About 16% was combusted at waste to energy facilities or basically incineration, uh, where they incinerate the waste and use it to generate electricity. And then the remaining 76% of our plastic waste was landfilled, uh, making up a little less than 20% of all US landfill waste. So what's happening to our plastic here in Gallatin Valley? Well, we don't have waste composition data from Logan Landfill, but it's probably safe to say that the EPA data It's safe to say the EPA data probably reflect what's happening here. Um, so I will say that I sincerely hope <laughs> that most of your plastic waste in Gallatin Valley is going to our local landfill, the Logan Landfill, because that is where most of our plastic waste belongs. Um, it belongs in the garbage because we can't recycle a lot of the plastics that we use. So our garbage system here in the Bozeman area, Gallatin County, is whether you're bringing your trash to a Bozeman convenience site or a hauler is picking up from your home, all of that garbage is being routed to the Logan landfill, which is about 27 miles west of Bozeman. And you can see the landfill from I-90. So the landfill has been around since the late 60s, early 70s. It is owned and operated by the county. And right now it basically has about 127 acres that are actively being used for garbage, as well as they have composting, electronic waste collection, um, and some other kind of waste disposal options there. So one thing I want to highlight right away is that Logan Landfill is not a dump. I do hear people use the term dump frequently. And just to clarify, a dump is a place where garbage is literally just thrown on the ground with no systems or engineering in place versus a landfill is a highly engineered system. Um, so Logan Landfill is a highly engineered system. And if you look at the diagram on your screen, it's basically showing you a very simplified look at what a landfill system looks like. Um, so first, landfills are typically sited in specific locations that get less precipitation or rain and that have the right geology that's going to help prevent any water pollution issues. Um, so our landfill is what's considered a dry landfill. They don't get that much rain out there. I think it's 12 or 13 um, inches per year. And they sited the landfill very specifically to minimize groundwater contamination. So with sanitary landfills, they are trying to basically design a closed system where we can put the garbage inside and it will stay contained and any byproducts that it creates will also stay contained. So most landfills, you're going to have um, some kind of clay barrier at the bottom, uh, plastic lining or geotextile membranes that can prevent stuff from seeping out. And then our landfills are also going to have systems of pipes for capturing leachate, which is essentially a uh, garbage juice or water that's flowed through the garbage, as well as methane gas, which is another byproduct of our landfills. Um, and the whole idea is that, OK, we want the garbage to stay inside, and we don't want these byproducts leaking into the environment. We want to do everything we can to protect human health and environmental health and our water resources. So at Logan, it is a landfill, and it is a highly engineered system that's designed to contain our trash. Um, this picture that you're seeing is showing you the leachate pond. So all the pipes that are underground divert the leachate or the garbage juice water to this evaporation pond where it evaporates off. Uh, the landfill has a whole bunch of methane gas wells, um, as well as a lot of different monitoring points around. And then basically what they're doing at the landfill is every day they're getting over 80 trucks per day that are bringing garbage in. They're covering that trash at night um, to basically help pack it down to help prevent stuff from blowing out. 
And I would say the biggest issue the landfill does face is dealing with the winds and having litter blow into the surrounding environment. So you can see that in this picture that unfortunately the landfill is in a windy location. It is open for most of the day when people are actively dumping garbage. And that means that any uncontained garbage, especially plastic bags, um, as soon as there's a gust of wind, it gets blown around. Logan tries using fencing to capture that plastic bag and clean it up, but it is an ongoing battle for them and many other landfills as well. So that's the landfill system. It is where our plastic should be going. Uh, the majority of what we send to the landfill does end up contained in underground, which is awesome. The other option here in Gallatin Valley is we do have the option to recycle our plastics. So before I get into the specifics of recycling in this area, I want to kind of back up and just look big picture at recycling. Um, so the first thing I like to remind people of is that recycling isn't just this like good thing we do to care for the environment and be responsible citizens. Recycling is a business. So while it may be a city or municipality in some cases who's collecting recycling, they're not entirely doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. They're also doing it because those materials are valuable. They don't belong in a landfill and they can be sold on a market um, so that there is profit that's made for the business and the material is being put to use instead of sending it to that landfill to just sit there forever where it can't be used again. So with recycling, it's not as simple as putting something in your recycling bin. Um, I can throw a strawberry clamshell container in my recycling bin and I guarantee you it will not be recycled. And the reason why is in order for something to be recycled, it has to meet the following criteria. Uh, so first, it needs to be a material that can be easily sorted from all the other materials that are mixed in with it. There needs to be demand for that commodity or that type of plastic in this case. And then we have some kind of physical limitations where it needs to be a material that can actually be made into something new that someone actually wants. And then finally, all of this, the sorting, the selling, the transporting, the remanufacturing, all of this needs to be done at a profit because remember, recycling is a business. And if we can't make a profit, if we can't <laughs> stay afloat, this business is not going to survive. So when it comes to plastics, there are a lot of challenges with all the different points that I just mentioned. And unfortunately, plastics only make up a really small portion of our recycling nationwide because of all those plastics. Um, there's just a lot more demand, a lot more recyclability for other materials, especially paper and cardboard and paperboard, metals even. Um, so unfortunately, not a lot of plastics plastic recycling is happening nationwide because we have all these challenges. So we'll take a closer look at what some of those challenges are. Um, one of them is basically due to the physical properties of plastics, they cannot be recycled over and over and over again like other materials um, such as glass, let's say, or metals, or even paper where we can get several recycles out of it. So unfortunately, due to their um, molecular properties, most plastics, if they can be recycled, usually can only be recycled one time. And they are what we call downcycled, where they can be chopped up and melted down and made into something else. But it's usually a lesser quality material that then cannot be recycled. So we have some, I would say, physical property challenges that make it really difficult to recycle plastics. Another difficulty of plastics recycling is just separating the materials. There are a lot of things we buy and use that are made up of several different types of materials. So that juice container that's plastic with a foil lid on it, we can't deal with that. A 
plastics recycler doesn't want it if the metal and plastic are mixed together because that's contaminating their plastic. <laughs> a metal recycler doesn't want it because it's contaminating their metal. Um, and then nowadays we're using more and more of these laminate products where plastic is fused or laminated to another material um, like aluminum or paper. And unfortunately, if we can't separate it into pure materials, then they can't recycle it. Another major difficulty of recycling plastics is sorting them out. So I told you all that we have our seven different types of plastics. Some are definitely more recyclable than others. So number one and two plastics, for example, um, have the most ease and value for recycling, but we use all kinds of different plastics. And in order to recycle them, we do need to be able to separate them and get the like ones all together. And that's really, really difficult to do. Sometimes it's even just difficult to determine what type of plastic something is. Finally, another major issue with recycling pl plastics is making the economics of it work out. So remember that recycling is a business and it has to be profitable to work. Well, it takes a lot of time and workers to collect, separate, sort, and transport your plastics for recycling. The price that plastic buyers are willing to pay for recycled plastics fluctuates on a daily basis like all commodities do and unfortunately it is oftentimes cheaper to make plastic um, or basically to make virgin plastic from oil than it is to make plastic from purchasing recycled plastic so if the economics don't work out or if there just aren't markets for our plastics that obviously creates a problem where we can't recycle something if we can't get good value for that material or basically there's no demand for it so looking locally at our recycling systems here in the gallatin valley i think for a relatively rural and relatively small population we are super fortunate to have pretty good recycling infrastructure um, so all of your recycling, whether you are bringing it to the county's free drop-off stations, whether a curbside hauler is picking it up, it's all going to the same place. And that's uh, We Recycle Montana, or you also may know it as Four Corners Recycling, which is out in Four Corners. So every day they are getting materials that are dropped off at their site. And then those materials go through some really basic sorting here. Um, we don't have a super high tech, like multi-million or billion dollar recycling facility. And so what they do when they get the materials is they do their best to sort it into like piles of, okay, let's get all our mixed paper together. Let's get all our cardboard together. Let's try to get all the plastic bottles and jugs together. And then all those materials are baled into gigantic bales of like materials. So once they kind of reach a critical mass for a material of, okay, we've got, you know, let's say a hundred bales of plastics, um, it's now ready to go. They reach that critical mass and then they ship it. And currently our plastics are going to Salt Lake to a materials recovery facility or basically a recycling center um, where those plastics are being sorted. Because right now our bales are mixed bales of number one and two plastics. Remember, a recycler doesn't want those plastics because they are two different materials with different physical properties. So down in Salt Lake City, they have more high tech machines um, that can use lasers and optics to help separate those number ones from number twos. So these MRFs, which exist in big cities, um, they separate materials of all kinds into bales, just like you saw in the last picture. And then our MRFs are selling those bales to recyclers. Um, and I, I will point out, some of you may be aware that um, prior to 2018, the US was exporting a lot of our plastic waste to China, especially. Uh, China decided it no longer wanted to be the world's dumping grounds. And basically there is nothing <laughs> plastic wise going to China anymore. So our plastics are ultimately staying in the US because that's where our markets are nowadays. Uh, we do have plastics recyclers in a variety of locations around the country. So when it comes to recycling in the Gallatin Valley, I did mention that we are limited with what we can accept for recycling. And the reason why is it really comes down to markets. 
Um, basically, we only accept number one plastic bottles and number two plastic jugs because those are the plastics that are the most easy to recycle and have the most value. Um, since we're in a rural location and our plastics and all recycling needs to be transported further away, that kind of cuts into the economics of recycling and it does make it difficult. So if you've come here from an urban area or a coastal area, let's say, you may be used to being able to recycle more plastics, but we are limited here due to our rural location, um, a lack of actual recycling facilities nearby where they're melting down the plastic and making new things and just the economics of it all. So what this means is if we're only taking number one plastic bottles and number two plastic jugs, like uh, milk carton, or, I'm sorry, milk jugs, water jugs, laundry detergent bottles, that does mean <laughs> that the majority of plastics that we're using can't be recycled. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, the litmus test really is, you ask yourself, is it a number one plastic bottle? <laughs> meaning that the mouth of it is smaller than the base? Is it a number two plastic jug? And if the answer is no, or I don't know, you should be putting it in the garbage. I do wanna point out that there are some number one plastics like berry containers and other clamshell packaging, especially that are number one, um, but they are not accepted for recycling because there are some slight physical differences based on how they're manufactured. Um, they cannot be recycled. They're really different, difficult to sort and separate. And unfortunately with number ones, it really is just the bottles that we can sort out and that have value and that actually can be made into something new. So I would say our biggest challenge here in the Bozeman area when it comes to recycling is contamination of the recycling stream by plastics that don't belong there. Um, anytime I stop by Four Corners, anytime I peek my head into the county's dumpsters, I pretty much always see all kinds of plastics, especially clamshells and sometimes plastic bags that don't belong there. And what people need to realize with contamination is that it can have serious consequences. <laughs> Meaning if we see too much contamination or too much garbage mixed in with a load, we can't recycle it. And right away um, the hauler may refuse to pick it up um, with the recycling truck because let's say Republic Services stops by your business, you have a recycling dumpster, if it's full of um, glass or non-recyclable uh, plastics, we can't dump that in our recycling truck because it'll mix in with everything else and there will be too much contamination and Four Corners won't take it um, because they don't have a way to pick all that contamination out quickly or effectively. And basically contamination can ruin the quality of our recyclables. The other thing to realize um, is that contamination, if a bale of recyclables has a bunch of garbage mixed in, it's not worth as much. A plastic recycler is not going to pay as much because they are going to have to take the time and spend the money to pick all the contaminants out. And then finally, the environmental impacts of wish cycling or putting stuff you wish was recyclable in the recycling bin are actually worse than you just throwing it in the landfill. Because what happens is all the garbage you're putting in, if it does make it to Four Corners, let's say, it's now getting shipped all the way to Salt Lake City, where at that materials recovery facility, they are going to have to pick the garbage out, the stuff that doesn't belong there, and send it to their local landfill. So the bottom line is if it's not recyclable, it's going to a landfill, and it makes more sense to send it to our landfill here that's only 20 miles away instead of sending it over 400 miles away to another landfill. So with recycling, one of the most important things we all can do to help keep recycling viable here in the Valley is to know what to throw and to keep it really simple. At Four Corners, they really can only handle your basic materials like cardboard.
make sure you've emptied it out. Uh, make sure it's clean, meaning it passes the yuck test. You should touch it and you shouldn't go, ew, yuck, or want to wipe or wash your hands. And then finally, make sure it's dry. And by dry, we say less than a teaspoon of water. If you do rinse something, it's okay if there's a few droplets of water, but we don't want lots and lots of water that can get mixed in with paper and make it moldy and, gro and gross. <clears throat> Um, and then finally, I think the best piece of advice for recycling is when in doubt, if you're not sure about something, <laughs> we really do want you to throw it out. <laughs> um, we would way rather your business or home produce a small bin of recyclables that actually can be recycled and have value rather than you have a giant dumpster every week that's full of recyclables that are actually mostly garbage. <laughs> So that's a, a look at plastics in the Gallatin Valley. Um, I oftentimes hear people say like, oh, it's kind of a bummer that we can't recycle much here. And then I always like to just kind of emphasize, empath, emphasize to them that really recycling is the last of our, our words. We always say reduce, reuse, recycle in that order because that is the order of importance in terms of conserving resources and reducing pollution and waste. Um, so I wanna just end my talk today with some ideas for ways that you can shrink your plastic footprint, meaning you can use less plastic and create less plastic waste because we really don't have optimal ways to manage that waste. Uh, so the first thing I encourage you to do is I encourage you to audit your waste. <laughs> um, this is a picture of me doing a food waste audit at a school. Audits are super fun. It's an opportunity to break into your household garbage, your office garbage, and to actually separate it into different categories and weigh it and look at it and just figure out what am I putting in the garbage? Um, I can tell you when I audited my own household waste that plastic packaging pretty much is the number one thing that we're putting in the garbage in our household, despite having recycling and compost systems here at home. So once you get an idea of where you're starting from and kind of what your biggest issues are when it comes to plastics, the next thing you'll want to do is focus on those most important R words, which are just rethinking and reducing. A lot of the plastics we use are disposable plastics designed for one-time use. And whether it's bringing your own bag to the grocery store, replacing Ziploc bags with um, beeswax sandwich wraps or sewn fabric sandwich bags, getting rid of disposable styrofoam coffee cups, replacing it with bringing your own mug, straws, spoons, water bottles, the list of items that you can replace with durables kind of goes on and on and on. And it really does make a difference and add up when we think about, okay, my habits alone, I'm one person out of 120,000 people in this county. If we all, let's say, brought our own bags to the grocery store every week, that would make a huge difference. Another thing to think about is just becoming a smarter shopper when you're going to the grocery store. Um, the good news in America is we do have a lot of choices at the store and we should think twice about those choices and really think about, okay, what shopping choice today is going to reduce my consumption of resources and plastic and reduce the amount of waste I'm sending to the landfill. So whether that's you know, selecting a paper egg carton instead of styrofoam, maybe that could look like buying your spinach loose instead of buying it in the number one non-recyclable clamshell container. It could be bringing your own reusable produce bags instead of using the disposable ones. And then really thinking about packaging waste of when we buy in bulk, uh, so we eat a lot of yogurt in my house, and buying it in a bigger container rather than those small individual serving sizes really will cut down on the amount of yogurt containers that I have to send to the landfill. Um, yogurt containers actually made me realize that, wow, even buying in bulk, we're still using a lot of number five non-recyclable plastic tubs. Um, so we recently learned that we can make our own. 
Um, so really thinking about, okay, we can do that with yogurt, maybe salad dressings, um, looking at where you're generating disposable plastics, maybe it's shampoo or conditioner. Nowadays, we have the internet as a great resource, and we can make a lot of things on our own if we have the time, and then put it in reusable containers, whether it's reusing old plastic containers or putting it in glass containers. Something we all can do is make sure we are recycling properly. When it comes to our plastics, um, the estimate is that only 30% of plastic bottles in the US do end up recycling. So there is tremendous opportunity for us here in Gallatin Valley to make sure we are recycling as many of those plastic bottles and jugs as possible. And just remembering that all those things need to be empty, clean, and dry. And then something else to think about is remember that recycling only works when there is demand for those products. As a consumer, buy recycled products because that does help drive demand for those products. Uh, nowadays, plenty of companies are advertising um, if their products are made with recycled content. Um, so that's something to just become more conscious of as a shopper. One really easy thing to do um, is to make sure that we are bagging our garbage. Remember that some little bits of our plastic do escape at the landfill. Um, so something my husband does that drives me crazy is he'll clean out the car and open up the trash can and go to throw loose trash in there. And I have to stop him and remind him like, hey, that needs to go in a garbage bag that can be tied shut because then when that is dumped out of the truck at the landfill, that heavy garbage bag is not gonna blow away. Whereas, okay, my loose grocery bag or that chip bag that I just throw in my garbage can absolutely could become litter if it blows away while it's being transported and emptied into the landfill. When it comes to litter, we can see just walking outside in our community that there absolutely is a need for everyone to be cleaning up litter. Um, some really cool resources are that the city of Bozeman does supply some resources to anyone who's interested in sponsoring a litter cleanup. So you can check out their website and then helping with litter cleanups uh, by providing or donating hauling of the garbage is something that Republic Services can help out with. So if you're involved with a nonprofit, especially, um, and you're interested in doing a litter cleanup, please contact me and I'd be happy to chat with you more about applying for a grant through our community grants program and seeing ways that Republic Services could help with your cleanup. Um, on that note, we are helping with a dog poop cleanup um, that is on April Friday, April 16th, that the Gallatin Watershed Council will be sponsoring. So keep your eyes out to help out with that because pet waste also is another problem in our local environment. Um, the next thing I can say is I really encourage you all to find ways to get involved. <laughs> so this could be getting involved at home. It could be getting involved at your kid's school. It could be getting involved at the university, at a place you work or a place that you worship. Um, the bottom line is there are endless ways to form a green team or start talking or organizing with other people. And whether that is looking at, let's say, replacing disposable plastic utensils in schools with durable ones or doing litter cleanup days, there are a lot of different organizations in this community that care um, and that can actually make changes that make a difference. Uh, finally, I encourage you to voice your concerns about plastic pollution, whether that's writing a letter to the editor um, for local publications or chatting to your neighbors in your neighborhood, whether it's going to a school board meeting, let's say, and talking about disposable plastics use at schools. There's a, a lot of ways to make your voice heard. And then uh, on like a more big picture level, um, make your voice heard when plastics legislation is up for review. So whether that's a city trying to do a plastic bag ban, I know Montana State Legislature had this issue come up last year. And actually just last week, um, there are It's pretty 
um, sweeping proposed legislation that would call for extended producer responsibility, which is basically making manufacturers of plastic waste have more accountability um, and take more financial responsibility for the design of their packaging, for the waste collection and recycling of it at the end. Um, and then this legislation also has some things that include uh, nationwide plastic bag bans um, and a bunch of other things. So there's a lot in it. It's worth taking a look at and then voicing your opinion to your elected representatives. People taking the time to voice their concerns has already led to a tremendous amount of success um, globally when it comes to reducing plastics pollution. The European Union is a great place to look at. Um, they've had EPR or extended producer responsibility in place for over two decades. And it might look a little different from country to country throughout the EU, but it has had a lot of success in reducing waste, reducing the amount of toxins that are in the plastics. Um, and basically the EU is currently working on having all plastic packaging be recyclable by the year 2030. Um, another great success story is even Norway and their uh, bottle deposit program. 97% of plastic bottles are recycled in Norway, so that's triple our recycling rate. And that's because they have a pretty hefty deposit on their bottles, and then they also have infrastructure set up to make it really easy for people to bring those bottles back to their local grocery store and get their money from it. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that. The, the U.S. is definitely not a leader nationwide when it comes to plastic bag bans and uh, moving away from disposable plastics. So it's great to see that in a lot of other countries, they have made tremendous progress in either outlawing or taxing or limiting disposable plastics production. And I say, hey, if Kenya and Tanzania and Madagascar can do it, surely we can do better than we currently are. Uh, the, the final thing I want to leave you all with is a quote. The greatest danger to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. Um, so I hope you realize that we all have a role in this problem and we all also have a role in the solution and solutions can start with the smallest thing. And um, sometimes that smallest thing can grow into really big things that have bigger and broader implications. So I hope I've given you all some food for thought in realizing that plastic waste is Plastic waste is difficult to manage and ultimately rethinking our consumption, reducing our consumption, especially of those one-time use plastics, um, those are gonna be where we make the biggest difference. And then just doing our best to reuse as much as possible. And then finally make sure that we are recycling correctly to keep that system, system viable and working. Um, so that's what I have for all of you. And now I would love to turn it over to questions. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you so much, Alexis. It was so helpful and so interesting um, uh, what you shared with us. Uh, I'm going to open up here um, our uh, questions and uh, hold on here. Let's open this up. And I'm going to see. Okay, so Sue Perrin asks, when I bring my plastic bottles to the recycling bin, I often see clamshells and tubs in there. Does that mean all that plastic in that bin will be thrown away or does it get sorted? Great question. It does not necessarily mean that all that plastic will be sorted away. Um, Again, Four Corners can do some limiting sorting, limited sorting. They are having to hand sort it. Um, so there really is a judgment call by first the hauler, whoever's picking it up of, okay, are there so many clamshells? This is considered contaminated where it has to go to the landfill. Um, so the bottom line is it's not necessarily automatically going to the landfill, but the more contamination there is, the more likely it will end up at the landfill. Okay, um, another question. Thanks so much, Alexis. Another que question from David Leverett. Um, it is only 20% of plastic that is that are number three through seven. 
and 80% are one and two bottles. I guess he's wondering if that's true or that's um, all. I think it's it's just a comment. So Dave Leverett actually owns and operates Four Corners Recycling. Um, oh, so okay. <laughs> what we're looking at here is maybe some good news that, hey, a lot of the plastics that we're using are these number one and number two bottles and jugs that can be recycled here in Gallatin County. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, David and Alexis. Okay, uh, Sue Perrin has another question. She's asking, why aren't we able to recycle number one yogurt containers? Um, most yogurt containers that I have seen, I'm pretty positive, are number five. Um, so I'm a little confused there. Um, and if there are number ones that can't be recycled, my understanding of, again, it comes to differences in shape and the difficulty of sorting and bailing it. And then that number one does not, a number one is not a number one is not a number one in terms of based on how that plastic was manufactured there are some slight differences in the physical properties which is again getting at why those clamshells are undesirable so to keep it safe and make sure we're not contaminating just sticking to that guideline of is it a number one bottle and if the answer is no or i'm not sure then putting it in the garbage is the best thing to do okay very good Okay, uh, now we have another question from Kathy Powell. She's wondering, what about plastic bottle caps? That's a great question. So plastic bottle caps usually are made of a number five plastic. There's been back and forth from different recyclers over the years. Uh, what we're hearing nowadays is that as long as bottle caps are screwed on tightly, that it's okay to include the cap when you put your emptied out plastic bottle in the recycling. The problem with loose lids right away is that those MRFs or those fancy like automatic automated recycling sorting facilities in the big cities, those little hard plastic bottle caps can actually jam the machines that sort the recycling. So we definitely don't want loose caps. Um, screw them on tightly or just throw the cap in the garbage. Oh, very, thank you. I was wondering that myself, so thanks. Um, next question, um, Patty Bartholomew asks, can paper bags be used to bag household garbage rather than a plastic bag? You know, that is kind of a tricky one of, um, I would actually lean toward the plastic because I think it's more likely to stay sealed shut. Um, if you felt like you had a good foolproof way to seal that paper bag shut, knowing it's gonna get tossed around, smushed in a, a garbage truck, um, I, I tend to lead toward, I, I think plastic actually is better because remember plastic does have that durability. And I do think that a plastic bag is gonna withhold the process of being transported to the landfill, dumped out, smushed and crushed um, better than paper will, unfortunately. So um, yeah, maybe, maybe the hope is in more uh, bioplastics potentially for garbage bags, but I, I do think containing our garbage so it doesn't blow away <laughs> as we're trying to cover it at the landfill um, probably is more beneficial than worrying about using paper. Hmm. Thank you, that's very useful uh, to know. Okay, um, next question. Susan Hinken um, asks, can you talk a bit about compostable containers? Awesome, yeah. Um, compostable containers, we do have some really good options here in the Gallatin Valley. So nowadays, I mentioned before that we do have what we call bioplastics or plant-based plastics being used to make everything from takeout containers to coffee cups to utensils, etc. cetera. Um, so the fantastic news is we do have two different um, commercial composting companies, Yes Compost and Happy Trash Can here in Gallatin Valley. Um, I would highly encourage you to just check with each, each company um, about what you're composting. Sometimes there can be misleading information on labels, but in the businesses that I've worked with, um, as long as you're 
clarifying it with the composting companies that it is indeed compostable in their facilities, we do have some great options in Gallatin Valley to reduce our dependence on traditional plastics and to use these bioplastics because we do have a waste management system that can recycle them in the form of composting. Oh, very good, thank you. Okay, next question uh, from Julie um, Kunin. Sorry, Julie, I don't know if I pronounced your name last, last name correctly, but she asks, um, can you recycle pasta boxes that have the plastic film window in them? And should I remove the plastic window? If you want to be a super superstar, yes, please remove plastic windows. Um, I kind of got into that with separating materials that if I'm a paperboard recycler, I want paperboard and I don't want plastic anything or any other material mixed in. So um, if you're willing to take the time to do that, that is absolutely awesome. And that's our ideal recycling practice. Okay, thanks. Okay, Jessica Ballard asks, is there a place in our community to put mixed paper? Yes, um, the, the, the best place would be taking advantage of the county's free drop-off sites. Um, so I can send this as part of the follow-up resources that we are going to send out afterwards. I forgot to include it, but basically the county does have these free sites and they do accept your mixed paper for recycling there. Um, so I will point you to a map of all the different locations. Thank you, very, very useful. Okay, um, let's see, uh, Rilla and Carl ask, um, when recycling bags at grocery stores, can bread bags, plastic bags that enclose clothing orders, et cetera, be recycled at those locations? And what happens to those bags? Are they really recycled? That's a great question. Um, plastic grocery bags, we don't want them in your recycling bins because of the difficulties of sorting them out. So in a lot of places in the US, grocery stores have stepped up as a place where you can bring those materials back for recycling and they are recycled. Um, so the issue is sorting them out of, basically they need to be all bunched together and not getting tangled up in machines. So with, plastic films, which is essentially what our grocery store bag is. Um, yes, you can mix in other types of plastic film, stuff you can poke your finger through, uh, but you'll really want to remove anything that is not the actual plastic film. So if it has a paper label, tear that off. Um, I've heard, you know, if it has like a zipper or something to tear that off. So if you can get it to basically be a simple uniform material just like a grocery bag is then it would most likely be fine to be putting your like clean bread bags um clothing bags that don't have any other material on it etc in there okay okay great thanks uh julie asks can recycled plastic bottles themselves go into the recycling bin or are they one and done this is recycled plastic bottles my understanding is as long as it's a plastic bottle um that it would a number one plastic bottle that it would be fine to put it in the recycling bin so basically i would look at the bottle to see what the the number stamped on it is look for that number one and if you can identify it is a number one it is a plastic bottle i would say recycle it away okay great uh patty bartholomew asks okay if we're not going to use paper bags um, to put our household garbage in, then what type of plastic bag do you rec recommend um, to bag it? You know, I haven't looked into that enough to have a great answer. So I would say I'll put that on my follow up as well, um, that I would be curious to look at what would be alternatives to traditional garbage bags that would meet the criteria of durability um, and just keeping everything contained. Right. Okay, we're at lots of good questions here. Uh, Kathy Powell asks, what's the best way to recycle shredded paper? Oh man, you know, shredded paper is the one I can never remember. So I would say Dave Leverett should comment and help us answer that question. <laughs> Because that, that's different in a couple different locations and I was just looking at this for the other Montana cities, so I don't want to misspeak. Okay. Okay, well, if Dave wants, to, I'll, I'll look for in the questions for his answer here. <laughs> um, 
meanwhile, let's Dave, see. <clears throat> Anne, if Dave wants to speak, his mic is open. Oh, is it? Okay. Dave? Is Dave still here, maybe? We'll give him. Are you there, Dave? Okay, I guess not. Maybe he can answer us later. Okay, um, another question from Janet. Um, she's asking when cycling, recycling cardboard with metal staples or tape, do the staples and tape need to be removed? Ideally, yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, as much as we can peel tape off, um, pull and rip and try to get the staples out. Ideally, yes, they will take cardboard that has a limited amount in it. But again, ideally, if you can, please remove that. It just increases the quality of that recycling, reduces contamination, and makes it more likely that it will indeed get recycled. Great. Okay, good, useful information. Okay, here's another follow-up to the other question um, that we had about um, putting bags, I think, in at the grocery store. They're asking, uh, uh, Carl and Rhea are asking, frozen fruits and vegetables are packaged in plastic. Is mm -hmm. this a laminate or can these be recycled with other plastic bags? I, I would say for most frozen that I have seen, they are typically not laminates to my understanding. If it has some kind of foil look to it, think Capri Sun juice pouch type look or feel, then no. But if it truly seems like just plastic that you can poke your finger through, make sure it's clean and doesn't have like smushed fruit or veggie residue. Um, so if you're pretty sure it's a single plastic material that is clean, then yeah, I think it's quite reasonable to put it in those grocery store plastic film collections. Okay, great. Uh, guess what? David Leverett has answered um, has awesome. answered our question. So here it goes. He said, bag it in pla in a plastic bag and put it in put it in a newspaper bag. Dave's uh, mic is open if he wants to answer Elaborate. that fully. We'll see, Dave, are you there? Maybe his mic's not working. Well, anyway, uh, we have so many questions. I just want to get to one more here. Um, Deborah Cadis um, asks, any glass options nearby? I've heard this a lot from people. Um, I've heard about some company in Four Corners that was collecting and hauling glass south. Any thoughts on benefit of transporting it to be recycled further away from here? Yeah, glass is really tricky and it's the most commonly asked question I get. Um, so really glass is not widely accepted in curbside programs in Gallatin Valley because of the economics of it, because it is really heavy and it does have to get transported all the way to Salt Lake City. Um, before COVID, Four Corners Recycling was accepting glass and you, you know, had to pay to recycle it there, um, but then COVID has kind of thrown their operations off and they're not currently open to the public or accepting it there. Um, so essentially when it comes to glass, it is one of our most difficult <laughs> materials of, uh, it is highly recyclable in theory, but in reality, the economics don't work out here. So what I've been trying to do personally is just looking at opportunities to rethink and reduce um, my biggest one lately has been like, okay, I'm using a bunch of glass for spaghetti jars and um, salad dressing. So just switching to making my own for those things when um, there aren't other packaging alternatives. Okay, thank you. Um, Dave, his mic is open if he wants to finish answering the question. Anne? Okay, Dave, are you there? I guess. Okay, I guess, I guess not. Um, we are getting towards the end of our um, questions, but we do, Kathy Powell does have her hand up. So uh, Lorene, um, does she need to unmute herself to ask her question? Um, she can, she is unmuted, so she can unmute herself, okay. so. Okay. Kathy, are you there? Do you have another question you'd like to ask, or maybe we already um, asked them in the questions? Um, uh, 
I would just like to ask Dave, but uh, maybe Alexis, you could ask him if he um, isn't isn't able to answer, or he could type it. What happens to the plastic bag inside the paper bag that's um, uh, when you're using shredded paper? Um, so yeah, I can tell you they'll pick it out at four corners and that would be part of their um, hand sorting process where their shredded paper is going to go in bales of shredded paper. Um, oh, okay. So that is some of the limited sorting ability they have is that their workers can remove the bags and then they're going to landfill them. So maybe a good idea. What I've done is um, I write on the outside of the paper bag shredded paper. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. That, that could help because they're using a hand sorting process. Yeah. Okay, well, do we have any other uh, hands up uh, that I missed? Anyone else have a question they want to ask? Because I think, uh, sorry if I missed one of them, but I think we got them all. Um, okay, well, thank you, Alex, very much. It was an extremely interesting and very helpful uh, talk tonight. We're so lucky to have you. I also want to thank all of you for joining us and all your excellent questions. Uh, please look um, for our Earth Day passport, which uh, once you collect enough stamps, it will enable you to put your name in for a drawing for a great prize. The passport will be available soon online at our website and at in-person Earth Day events in April, such as our Earth Day Festival at the Bozeman Public Library on April 17th. Also, be on the lookout for a follow-up email from this event, which will list upcoming events and also will um, give you some in additional information um, about recycling. I wanted to thank Lorene Reed from Sacagawea Ottoman Society for her excellent tech support tonight. And of course, a big thank you to Alexis Alloway of Republic Services uh, for being here tonight and sharing all this great information. I just want to say have a wonderful evening, and we hope that you can join us for another Gallatin Valley Earth Day event soon. And good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. If you want to unmute yourself, you can say goodbye. <laughs> Good night. Good night and thank you. Good night.